super hipster. Uh, ham and pencil. <laughs> Capybaras. Assuming those are a type of giant rodents. Uh, let me make sure that I get this right. Giant rodents. Write that down. Giant rodents, not robots. Maybe rodent robots. I want to get my ham and pencil one. Oh, here. Actually, I can just move it over here. Yeah, ham and pencil. <laughs> ham and pencil. I don't know what that game would be, but it feels like a good one. Whatever it is. All right, I got a tweet. Tweet, we are live. And we're live. <laughs> Emergency Cappy, is this a. Uh... Oh my gosh! <laughs> gosh, these are so adorable. Ducks and capybaras is the best thing ever. <laughs> I love how I discover so many fantastic websites and links from, from just doing this stream. Yep. Rats of unusual size has to go on there. Not that we're specifically going to be ripping off the Princess Bride, because there already is a Princess Bride game, a role-playing game. But any brainstorm about rodents, giant rodents, should at least include a reference to this. <laughs> I love that it's unusual, too, because that could mean different things, right? It's a very flexible term. Alright, yeah. I'm gonna put the, the capybara picture there. Look at this capybara with the... There's a hawk. That's so cute. The duck one, I think, is the best I've seen so far, though. Look at this with the ducks. I didn't realize that a capybara was a rodent. That's cool to know. <laughs> but is there a pirate groom RPG? I don't know about that. Are you serious, cat, right now? Alright. Also, I don't know if you can hear it, but for some reason I have helicopters swirling right outside my windows. So that's fun. We're snuggling now. There we go. You want to be on camera, then you get to be on camera. Yeah. Let's see how you feel about all these marmots and stuff. So for those of you who missed it, the whole inspiration for uh, the rodents of unusual size was my great nature trip this weekend. made a marmot friend. I don't think I even really knew what marmots were before this, but they are fantastic and adorable. What do you think about that? What do you think about those giant rodents? Think you would eat that? They'd probably beat you up. You're not very tough. <laughs> Swat copters? Yeah, they're gonna swing in through my, my windows. Just crash right in there. They are the mountain mountain whistle pigs. Yeah, somebody 
I forget who posted the sounds that they make, but when you're up on the mountains, we're up on Mount Rainier, and you hear just these high-pitched noises. It sounds like a weird bird call, and actually comes from the marmots, apparently, which is super fun. I'm gonna write that on my brainstorm. Yeah, what do you think about that? You're involved now. You're 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 a streamer. You're a professional streamer. All right, we got marmot in our brainstorm. We got how do I spell capybara? Capy capybara. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, marmot slash mountain. Whistle pig. Are you done? You done being a streamer? You done poking me? Right. Go sit on your sofa. So, right off the bat, the first thing that comes to my mind from a game design perspective, uh, the funny names we call things. Uh, folk names? Reminds me a little bit of the music genre game that we came up with recently. Let me see if I can pull up the spreadsheet for that, because that was pretty fun. Uh, music. Er, genre? Game design. Game design stream. <laughs> I think that was Portmanteau. Yeah, that was weird. I should rename that. Yeah, so recently on a stream, we were talking about creating music genre names by taking a bunch of different music genres and chopping them up. And it didn't get very far with the gameplay for this one, but I had fun bringing it out with people and just picking and choosing things from the list, like pop funk or dirty dub goocher. I think that's probably supposed to be future. I don't know how that ended up being goocher. Future. Dirty future dub. So a lot of fun stuff in this. We could do something similar. but for animal names. Regional folk names. <laughs> so for this, it could be like whistle, pig, mountain, mountain whistle goat. Uh, cow, I think, is another term that's used. So you could extrapolate that out. Mm, actually, you can just put a table in here, like a yeah. Mountain, island, plains. What else? A uh, desert. Uh, swamp. Oops. <laughs> so if we're using, uh, and this actually goes back to that, the, um, ham and pencil hipster business name generator. Full Folk animal name game slash generator. Uh, region bi biome? 
I guess is a general term for different, like a mountain island <laughs> musical sound. That could be a little too general. Uh, just a descriptor, maybe. And then common animal. So pig, cow, rat. Goat, snake. <laughs> the fennec fox makes the most screeching noise. What does the, what does the fox say? Right, that's probably where that comes from because they make noises unlike really what you think about. Whistle pig sounds like a cryptid. Ooh, cryptids. Uh, cryptid name generator. I have the standard variety whistle pigs trying to tunnel into my house. If only I didn't have a stone foundation. I didn't realize that there were such big tunnelers. <laughs> Hyperwave twilight beat. <laughs> I know, right? You come up with these things, you're like, that couldn't possibly be a, a genre. Kawaii ska, I like. It was always fun studying critters in college and learning the scientific name, which is global standard, and the common name. Uh, right. Folk names, regional names, common name. Common names are completely unregulated, and some critters had multiple names, though there tended to be one that was more commonly recognized. Hence, groundhog, woodchuck, woodchuck, whistle. Like, wait, is a groundhog the same as a marmot? This is gonna. What? Oh my gosh, she's blowing my mind right now. I didn't realize. Because I looked at it, I was like, wait, that's a groundhog. And so I was like, it's a marmot. I'm like, oh, okay. But a groundhog is a marmot. Oh my gosh. Knowledge. Marmot sounds like a much more technical term. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, yeah. And so there's the scientific... Names, so I'm gonna say versus science name. Ugh. Too many lids. Standardized name, universally recognized name. Technical name. So, what is it for marmot? Marmota. Genus Marmota. Hmm. So, marmot, groundhog is that seems like a more. A more common name. Mm. Can I adjust the size of this? I'll play with that and run with that later. Marmot is more similar to the scientific name, whereas something like well, groundhog is medium scientific. And then completely off the wall. So three names for every categories for every creature. And the interesting thing about the scientific name is it's standard, universal. It's a way that scientists can communicate about an animal while knowing exactly what animal they're talking about. Then for the common names, one animal can have multiple common names and multiple animals can have the same common name. So there could be something like a rat, right? Probably more specific than that, but a rat in one location, a rat in another location could technically be, or there's like lots of different types of rats. You're like, oh, that's a rat, but it's not scientifically accurate. 
because that could describe many different things. Marmot. I want what's the f full technical name for that? Not to be confused with Marmoset. Thanks, Wikipedia. It's great. Large squirrels in the genus Marmota. So Marmotini Marmota? Is that how it works? Tribe genus? Or maybe uh, it's supposed to be family genus. Forget my science. Gotta bring that back. Gotta bring that back into my brain. So the family is Scuridae and the genus is Marmota. So I believe it would be a Scuridae Marmota. Sidebar on the technical terms. I really like the way that Wingspan treats it because you have these really awesome colorful birds, very diverse types of birds, and they have the common, co common names on there and the scientific names. Uh, wingspan. Card. Card sleeves. I have the game in the other room. I don't really want to break it open right now. If I could just... Yeah. Common Raven. Yeah, this is a great example. Open a new window. Bring it over here so you can all see this. So this wingspan isn't about the naming of the creatures, which seems to be, for the moment, where our potential game design idea for today, the direction that it's going in. But I like this with wingspan, how it's got the common raven and then corvus carax. Uh, it just sounds cool, right? And gives you a feel within the game that you are birders or biologists, scientists looking in on these birds. Kind of elevates the theme of the game, which I think is really cool. Scuridae Marmota. All right, so coming back to this table I was putting together. Yeah, I kind of wish that, yeah, I had the wingspan cards because I think they've got a lot of cool common name descriptors in them. Uh, golden, so colors, descriptor, colors, the colors that they are, the sounds that they make, uh, other descriptive information. So golden, like Island golden cow, <laughs> island golden rat. Typically be a color of the animal. Whistle will be a sound that it makes. Uh, <laughs> plains candy pig. I don't know about candy. Candy could be a color, I guess. Um, leaf pig. It could have something to do with the environment it lives in. Uh, habitat, whether it's nocturnal or diurnal. Cactus. <laughs> what it eats. So desert, desert, not dessert, desert cactus rat. I like that. Uh, bug is another cool one here. See, now I just want to fill out this spreadsheet with like all sorts of cool things, but not sure where we're going with this yet, so I'm just gonna put a few things in there. Color, sounds, environment, habit, what it eats. Uh, what other descriptors could we put in here? Because I liberally crib from the wingspan cards. Roseate spoonbill. Uh, so. Description of body parts. Great blue heron, snowy egret, so it's like an environment, or the 
color of the color of the actual animal. Great egret. Claw. This gets interesting. For the birds, it's easier because you could reference wings and bills, the kind of physical aspects that all birds have, or most birds, all birds have. I think all birds have wings, even though they don't all fly. Uh, I think all birds have bills as well. We're getting very scientific here. I don't think we necessarily have to be too scientific about this amorphous game idea that we're coming up with right now, but it's good to have a little bit of rooting in the direction we want to go. Um, eyes, I guess. Most animals have eyes, so blue eye. Or blue toad. Most animals have toes. It's a question for the future, right? What body parts do most animals have? Question mark. Mountain leaf rat. Uh, oh, it's got pushed down. Island blue-eyed cow. Island blue-eyed pig. Okay. <laughs> Lesser spotted barred weasel. <laughs> I like that one. You see, and that's the thing too, with these lists, it's cool coming up with things from the list, but at a certain point, you're definitely limited, where sometimes if you're just trying to brainstorm ideas, like name an animal species off the top of your head without having to pick from a gra from a chart, you can come up with sometimes funny, more funnier, more interesting things. And some people like that. Some people like coming up with things and some people feel very stressed out and would rather have a chart and be able to mix and match things from there. You can also do a mix of the two, have some determined information and then have players add their own twist or add half and half, you know, pick two words and add two words. It's an interesting question from a game design perspective, because there's a lot of games that have a known or knowable set of options, games that lean on the cards and the combination of the cards for some amount of humor or surprise. Cards Against Humanity, Apples to Apples, uh, monikers, and potentially with this, if we were to move forward with having each of these be cards, and again, not sure about the final format of the game, but something potentially mixing and matching terms to come up with funny names. If that were to be the whole game, uh, and it was strictly picking things from a chart like this, then you would have to consider you know, what's it like once people have gone through the whole card set once or twice? Is it still a fun game to play? Marmots and woodchucks are closely related species. There's a bunch of different marmot species. Oh, cool. See itis, uh, this website for a full listing of marmots. Copy. <laughs> I will do that. I will read about marmots to my heart's content after the stream. That sounds super fun. If you say robin in the US, you think of a different bird than if you say robin in the UK. Right, robin red best, best exactly. Different species, same name. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Oh. Marmota. Oh, okay. Species, I think, is what I'm... Oh, okay, because the marmot is a class. Oh, so species, right. Subgenus. Alaska marmot. Bullback marmot. Okay, cool. So that would be, instead of being the <clears throat> Securidae marmota, would be the Alaska marmot. What is the marmota browery? Okay. Cool. Yeah. Oh, 15 different species. That's where I was getting caught up in my marmot research because it didn't. Marmot is a bigger class than I was aware of. I mean, also it's great marmot stuff today. And science, science. And there's the varmint. 
feel like that'd be related in something. The varmint and the marmint. Marmint. Varmint. Genus species. Yeah, that makes sense. Corvus Corax. That was the raven. Dang, that font is on <laughs> The lowercase o and a are almost uh, identical. Yes. Uh, wingspan, if you want to get a very good sense of what the, the terms actually are, you, you might be making some mistakes there. They definitely had a little bit of style over function. Decent number of animals and plants in the Americas were named in languages other than English, and their English names are transcriptions of what their original names sounded like to English ears. Huh. I like the idea of that. You're just like, well, it's a flutie. <laughs> it's like a, like a flute. It's like, no, it was based on a word in a different language. So it doesn't actually mean anything in English. Pseudo-build shrew thrush. <laughs> you see? Oh. <laughs> Pseudo-build, because we were talking about whether all birds had bills or not. I don't even know if that's a real thing. That could totally be a real thing or not. There's no way to know. Except if we look it up on Google, that's a way to know. Okay. So we're in an interesting place now. Of course, not committed to designing a game specifically that's come up with funny animal names. Kind of the closest to all the ideas that we're discussing right now but seems a little limited from a game design perspective seems more of a riding in a car activity or get out a pen and paper and playing with your friends or your kids or nieces and nephews like hey let's this is, these are some animal names what kind of animal names can you come up with or potentially looking at a picture of an animal and trying to name it <laughs> alright this is the part of the show where I draw a capybara or a marmot or something Ooh, okay rodent like it's got a either floofy or flappy tail uh, maybe it's a weasel. It's got a very long belly. And then... I like their big noses. And the ears were... They weren't big or sticking out. We'll say that the tail is fluffy, not like a otter tail. Uh, and it's furry coming up on winter, so it's starting to develop its winter coat. Uh, maybe it has stripes. <laughs> Inventing animals? Or just the name? Could go either way with this, right? You could start with a picture of an animal and come up with a name. Or start with a name and try and figure out what the animal looks like. Drawing? <laughs> oh, here's a funny one. Uh, animal name. Animal picture. Animal name, animal picture, telephone game. That would be kind of fun if you're going back and forth between naming things and somehow generating the pictures of those things. And you can make it cool, like with telephone, how the message becomes illegible down the path of people passing it on. Uh, so, for example, this one right here could be striped. 
kloof-tailed cherry pig. <laughs> Throw in a few things there, and then someone has to determine Is it, does it eat cherries? Does it look like a cherry? So they might decide that it looks like a cherry. Rounded cheeks, a little tuft on the head. <laughs> and this you know, it doesn't describe what type of animal it is. Maybe it's a bird. Maybe it's a rodent. Um, that's the interesting thing about the names, right? Sometimes it can be... Uh, they can call it cherry big if it's actually a bird. So this is... <laughs> it's turned into a type of owl. Mm, smile doesn't really make sense. There you go. Yeah. Color in the beak. Does that look like a beak? I don't know where we're going with it. So our, now our stripe uh, would have to have a tail. Blah. Striped floof tailed cherry pig is an owl all of a sudden. Alright, when a new species is discovered, the discoverer gets to come up with both the common and scientific name. The scientific name generally roughly translates to some sort of physical description, Latinized. It can be fun to have a charades-like game where one player assembles a new scientific name of a common object and the rest have to figure out what it is. Hmm, I like that. And this is leaning somewhat on existing things which is fun because as much as it can be fun to draw things drawing games definitely have very divisive opinions divisives some people usually the ones who are very good at drawing or at least who are confident or not worried about their drawing skills enjoy it a lot of people get pretty hung up on their ability to draw, even when it comes to games, right? They'll, they'll try and draw things, it's just a game, you can do a silly stick figure, but they feel like people judge them for their drawing abilities, which can be stressful. Uh, I like this idea of taking something, scientific name of a common object, like a, would it have to be an animal? Like a broom, for example. <laughs> Woodicus. Oh man. This this would be cool with <laughs> stick. <laughs> Woodicus clean. I feel like I would need a Latin for sweep. I feel like I would need a Google to translate these things. Or some sort of reference guide. <laughs> sweep. Arapient partis. <laughs> Woodicus partis. Actual rodent game. Scientists taught rats to play hide and seek. Oh my gosh, now I'm just gonna be super distracted by this. Oh my gosh, that's so cute. They rewarded the rodents with tickles. That is fabulous, and everyone should check that out. Maybe the object is 
to bridge descriptors that have been designated for only a couple of animal types. It's a mighty otter looking capybara. Hey, look, I, I knew what it was in my head and then I got to the tail. It got very long. It got longer than I expected it to be. <laughs> Generating a crazy animal name and trying to draw it. The short legged, <laughs> short legged otter. <laughs> Bar, I don't know what that says. <laughs> that super cracks me up. I don't know why. The game about making fun of your friends' drawings, but in a supportive way, so we can all laugh and have fun. <laughs> Let's all make fun of each other's drawings in a fun way. Maybe along the lines of a word slam with lots of Latinized word cards that players could assemble. Yeah. That was along the lines of what I was thinking for the music genre game. Um, bridge descriptors that have been designated for only a couple of animal types. Ah, oh, shoot. What was that game? I was... Kickstarter. The one by Richard Garfield and Ken Jennings. Half Truth. Uh, yeah. Actually, this is a uh, cool looking. I'm going to post this. Whitticus Briss Bristlecus. Uh, yeah, so this makes me think a little bit about. Half Truth, new game coming out by Richard Garfield and Ken Jennings of Jeopardy fame. The idea behind this game is that you don't have to, it's not a trivia game where you have to f figure out from your brain what the answers to things are, which I find difficult, a lot of people find very difficult, but it lists the items on the cards. Uh, and you take, you bet players bet on which one they think is the correct one. I believe I haven't dug too much into the game. But something like that where all of the items and knowledge are contained within the game. And the fun part of it is playing around with the pieces that you're provided. Uh, and then what you were saying about the word slam Uh, I started the music genre generation game as a spreadsheet just to get a bunch of things down really quick so I could play around with it, but functionally trying to pick things out of the spreadsheet was tricky. People thought they had to pick something from each column. Turns out a spreadsheet is a very f formal formalized format for transmitting information. So having cards that you could play around with could be fun. Um, and then tying these ones together, Latinized words. Descriptors that have been designated for only a couple animal types. Hmm. So what might this look like? Uh, I gotta make this into a list because we're brainstorming some ideas here. The cards themselves could have both a picture and a list of a bunch of potential names, possibly on the other side of the card. Could 
could be animal pictures on one car, then whole decks of cards you can go through to make the names. Yeah, you're right. That's good that you brought up Word Slam because they have a really cool way of making you making your team guess the words. For anyone who hasn't gotten to check out Word Slam, two teams of people, you have a little tray, like a Scrabble tray, where you put cards on it, and you have multiple decks of cards that are nouns, verbs, adjectives, I believe. There's some separate piles of these cards, and you are looking through the cards really quickly. Like you're, you wanna come up with a, you're trying to say the word snowball, for example, and you're looking through just through adjectives like uh, cold and then shapes. You come up with sphere uh, and then a verb throw, right? And both teams are yelling out answers at the same time. So even though one team can't see the tray that the other team has, you can listen to the words they're saying. And it usually comes out pretty quickly once you get both teams going and yelling at the same time. So functionally having the piles of cards that you can dig through. Uh, piles of cards that belong in categories, making it easier to search. Search through. <laughs> Drawing animals based on a name either uh, generated from scratch or from cards or other inspiration. I wonder if you could make it, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking animal construction. I feel like I've talked with some people recently who've been creating animals out of portions of cards, like the those children's books with the moving pages where you can make different things. I saw one of those books recently and Magic the Gathering also does this for the unstable uh, some of the conjunction cards. You have a horse on one thing and then on the card next to it you might have a <laughs> emu. Snake. Snake. All right, snake's easy to draw. Do. For some reason, it looks like a dog now. I don't even know what I'm doing. Is, is it the ears? The horse ears are more rounded? Wow, never mind. It's not a horse, it's a dog because that's that's what's happening. <laughs> dog snake. So I've seen things like this before, but it'd be interesting to see if you could get a little more creative with the systems. Uh, and have it be, man, how, I don't even know how you'd do, <laughs> but you'd have like the body, which should be a circle, and then you could, man, maybe that'd be like square cards, but printed right up against the edge, which would be tricky, and then like a head, and then like ears. arms cards might be a little tricky might have to be tokens tiles tokens build an animal from scratch actual latinized words used in scientific names cool that's helpful do love me some Wikipedia resources. Pinecone legged scrub chicken. See, send your bug. You, you seem to be good at this game. Like this, I don't yet know what the final structure of this is gonna be, but just, I feel like there's something there for just coming up with funny animal names. And maybe it's not the whole game, you know? Maybe that's just 
part of it. I like naming things. A smaller system or part of a game. Because that's a fun thing about a... One of the things I like about role-playing games is you can name your character, obviously. And if you get familiars or pets, you get to name those things as well. I would love to play something that involves more naming of things. Can you name things in a mechanical way? <laughs> Would this be a role-playing game or storytelling game that just has a ton of naming? Question mark. I don't know, where, where are we going with this chat? What are we doing? Do you remember those fake scientific names sometimes shown on the Roadrunner cartoons? Wait, are those fake? Tasmanian Wolf. I always thought they were real. Roadrunner show. A cartoon. <laughs> oh my gosh, it just shows. Oh, okay, I know what you're talking about now. I love the first part of this. Just shows a Roadrunner. It's actually super cute. Look at that little thing. Geococcyx. Geococcyx californianus. California Roadrunner? That's cool. Roadrunner. Accelerati Incredibus. Carnivorous Vulgaris. <laughs> Eat Eatibus almost anything else. <laughs> Famishus Vulgaris Ingenusi. Birdius Hybolius. <laughs> Those are some good examples. Uh, I'm just gonna leave this open so I can reference that. Some funny stuff there. I have a chicken game that I wanted to come up with weird chicken varieties for. <laughs> weird chicken varieties. What is this chicken species? What is the chicken? scientific name. List of chicken breeds. Because a breed is different than a species, right? 39 varieties of chicken. There's a lot of different chickens. Chicken scientific name. Gallus Gallus Domesticus. Wow, that's super cool. Genus, species, subspecies, gallus gallus. <laughs> but putting a scientific term on that would make that super fun. Discovering naming animals and plants is sort of a weird thing. It's a very western centric. Interesting. It's basically, I've discovered the new animal. It's a raccoon. While indigenous folks who live with it for generations are standing right there. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. That's a good thing to to call out. Maybe that could be part of the game. Maybe that could be a game is taking back the the names, the true names. True names is a fun thing too, right? True names have power over something by knowing it's Uh, oh my gosh, indigenous people. Taking back the names of things. Speaking of naming things, naming... 
episode. What's in a name? Breaking down names. Reassembling names. Discovering the true name, creating the true name. So we're going to get kind of metaphysical here. Talking about naming things, but like you said, game biologists, it's a very Western centric thing. Like these things existed if you see something you've never seen before is not in your culture's taxonomy of creatures the thing existed before you named it and now that you've named it you have a way of categorizing and understanding it categorizing understanding Studying, researching, using, researching. Yeah, I'm having trouble with that word today. Researching, using the animal. You can make use of it now that it's named. Kind of relates back to the tr concept of a tr true name from magic or sorcery, right? Now that we're talking about this, I want to know where the true name, true name nemesis. Oh, that's a magic card, I feel like. Where the whole concept of true name come from? <laughs> true name is a name of a thing or being that expresses or is somehow identical to its true nature. The notion that language or some specific sacred language refers to things by their true names has been central to philosophical study as well as various traditions of magic, religious invocation, and mysticism, and mantras. Okay, and this goes back a long time. Folklore, literature, looks like back to Egyptian times. And this concept of a true name. Hmm. Where's the, where's that chicken my name? My true name is Cluckitus Laudamus. So we'll say scientific name. We talked earlier in the show about how there's common names and creatures can have multiple common names, especially of different groups of people having discovered things at different times. It could be the same animal species wise in different locations that people didn't get together historically to name everything. So things can have multiple names. But for the scientific name, there's presumably only one name for everything. It kind of relates to the true name in a way, this concept of this is the, the atomic nature of the thing. This is the absolute sphere in which it exists. Say so the absolutely design defined sphere of existence of a thing. Uh, yeah, but again, coming back to what you said, game biologist, it's, it's interesting that this is still from a particular perspective. Some might argue that the scientific name is the correct name for a thing, but these things all existed before science, right? Science is a relatively new 
construct. Existed before science and naming. Think about it. Man, yeah, even thinking about that, going back on that is kind of weird, right? You look at uh, all the dinosaurs with their scientific names. Also, especially, uh, I'm going to put this in here because I think it's important, the evolution of scientific names. Think about dinosaur names. gonna say is in the early 1900s lots of dinosaurs being quote unquote discovered from fossils but there was a lot of other stuff going on uh, fossils put together incorrectly People trying to discover a new species, even making things up, to get the glory of the discovery. And this weird thing happened where a thing had a scientific name, but it wasn't real. Or it was actually a different thing. And it's funny with dinosaurs because people get emotionally attached to them, right? The There's certain ones where there's a Tyrannosaurus Rex or something, Brontosaurus, things that we grew up in the, with in the 80s and 90s that turned out to not be a real dinosaur or it turned out to be several categories of dinosaurs that just got assembled incorrectly uh, so this is a potential additional direction to go in with this game design idea discovering species from fossils prints eggs other remains, naming them. <laughs> uh, naming them early, trying to be the first to discover a species. Where it might not be an actual species and someone might out you if they find new information, but at the same time, everyone wants to discover their own species. That's a pretty cool idea. It ties a little bit into an idea we were talking about a couple months ago called Truth of Science, I think, where you're putting down theories and you're trying to use the, the data in your hands from other cards to prove or disprove these pseudoscientific theories. So this could be a race game where people are trying to put down the cards and build up a species. And once you get a certain number of cards, you can say like, hey, this is a new species. But someone else could discredit Ooh. discredit you with new data that in order to do so, they have to take time off from making their own species. Okay, okay. Seems like some fun ideas there. 
Coming to you out of level for this discussion, but I'm struck more and more by the dichotomy of the human desire to partition reality into boxes, as though the idea of sorting and naming a thing makes it known or controllable, and the reality of everything existing on a spectrum with ebb, ebb and flow between humanity's boxes. Even the concept of species is less fixed than textbooks would have you believe. I don't think that that's too high level. I think that's actually super fascinating. And it not knowing nearly enough about science and categorization. I, again, I would say like we look, I look at science and scientific notation, right? These things are supposed to be absolutely set in stone. And what you're saying here about species not being as fixed as textbooks would have you s would have us believe kind of fits into evolution too, right? And our understanding and theories about these things and understanding in the scientific community is always changing, but people who aren't there seeing the changes in real time can easily get attached. Again, the dinosaurs with feathers and Pluto as a planet, there's all these things that we form emotional bonds to, like this idea that a species is a thing, is an atom, right? That can't be subdivided and is completely different from this other thing. And this idea that there is more fluidity between the things makes total sense and can be hard and frustrating for people who want to put things in boxes, right? And that's why I kind of like where this potential design idea is going because it plays around a little bit with the fluidity of science. And you can lean into that potentially. And not that you, the games will necessarily have a bigger message or go above and beyond to say something really important about real life, but you can play around with things. You can gently ease these concepts into game design and make richer games for it. Scientific fluidity. Uh, there can be politics too, right? Not only is the science itself changing, but the politics that are related to it can make people be less scientific than they otherwise would be in a vacuum. And now, that now that I'm thinking about true names though, I oh, this is feeling like a couple of different ideas potentially. Cause that's something that's always kind of percolates in the back of my mind. I think about it every few months or every couple of years, right? It's like, oh yeah, the true names are a thing where, you know, if you knew a dragon's true name, you would have control or power over them. <laughs> Idea the second. <laughs> Naming things and then you have power over them. Which is interesting, potentially, but also how does this play with consent, right? Because uh, that would be a tricky concept that if you're talking about owning something or controlling something that is a living thing with a name. And most likely sentience, right? Can get problematic. So maybe it doesn't have to be about ownership or power dynamics. So let's, let's talk about 
where we're at right now before we dig more into one of these concepts. This time I like to go back to what we've been discussing throughout the stream, provide a little recap for people who might just be joining us. We started our stream with the giant rodents keyword in our brainstorm. Moved around talking about rodents of unusual size, capybaras, regional and folk names. Talked about potential ideas for drawing things, naming things. Then got onto this cool idea about fossils or animal remains. <laughs> I'm just going to draw some bones here. This is a bone. This is also a bone. And so how, if you had, if this was on cards, maybe you would have the cards be pieces of animal skeletons. Uh, so it could be a wing. It's a little hard to tell from that. Alright, so what is this functionally going to be? Just spitballing, brainstorming here. Card could be... pieces of animal skeletons that you are trying to assemble correctly. There is some hidden information. Maybe the game doesn't actually have right answers for how the skeletons go together. So every game can be different. I don't think you'd want to have it be so if someone had played the game, they'd look at the different pieces and be like, oh right, the wing goes with this other. So it's not, you don't want it to be puzzly. But more of a information, trading, and negotiation game, bluffing. Huh. I always come back to bluffing with a lot of the games that I'm working on. Bluffing. Uh, push your luck. Claim the prize for naming. A fossil. Uh, then it becomes harder to disprove. Hmm. <laughs> that could be a little weird if people just had. disprove cards they could play it on anything uh, think about it a couple different directions piles of name fragment cards when the cards run out <laughs> the game is done. So the name fragments, see, there could be three piles, right? So you're getting cool stuff like uh, some of the names, the pinecone legged scrub chicken, right? For the, well, there's four, but if you're looking at like our chart up here, this is like, it's the desert leaf rat, and you only have 10 piles of those. So once 10 species have been named, that's it, the game's over. Maybe play around with the different ones and uh, have a little control of what the name is. Uh, 
in your hand you have data of how different skeletal pieces remains fit together. Um, there's never like a full picture of a dinosaur or whatever these creatures are. So it's not like a, I'm piecing to all the things and then I have the proof in my hands of what it is, but we're having different pieces. The, the data, the evidence, evidence is a good word that shows like, it's like, oh, I put these pieces together and then this is the, the dinosaur. You could just totally make that up and be like, oh, I'm taking the names. Or you could have the pieces so people could ask to see your evidence or your proof that this is a real dinosaur. Okay. There's number a full picture of a skeleton put together. People could ask to see the information, the information slash evidence. that you assembled and named your creature using. Um, maybe there's only a certain number of ways the cards can go together. So people can't get conflicting fossils each identical picture only belongs to one animal so you have this one here number 52 this particular wing piece goes to a particular creature wing fragment i'll say creature can only go to one creature Maybe you have a uh, potential evidence and confirmed evidence. Maybe there's partially shared tableaus. Maybe other people can play on your tableau, which would be cool. Can play on your. Tableau and claim your creature. Uh, Alright, this is... So there's potential evidence and confirmed evidence. You can take actions to uh, prove your cratcher, your creature is a thing. Okay, got some fun things going on here. Some different components. A rough outline of a game where you're assembling your dinosaurs, assembling the bones uh, visibly. I don't think I've, I really made that clear. Visibly face up, visibly, <laughs> visibly, oh my gosh, yeah. face up, then you're assembling hidden evidence that could prove your dinosaur, your creatures are real, or could be a bluff. Does anyone call your bluff? Hmm. 
<laughs> Seems like a lot of things going on in this game, but I like the general framework of that, where you have the bluffing element and then assembling your creatures and giving them cool names. That's an important part, tying back to what we talked to earlier. Okay, from earlier, alien scientists land on Earth millions of years after the end of humans. What odd remains, artifacts do they find in modern society? How do they classify the evidence in the species? I like that too. I like... So this uh, pseudoscience or historical... It could go either way. Historical, uh, the dinosaur rush, because this was definitely a thing, right? When they first started to dig up these dinosaur fossils and people were becoming known and famous for doing so, right? There was, I have to look up the history of it to see exactly, because I have it fixed in my mind that people were coming up with species and not necessarily, and there was fakes and things going on. Or, futuristic working with different types of creatures alien species can you play around and have a little more flexibility and fun whereas the historical version can be a little more referential of what actually happened if there was a history there so that could be cool he wrote it says one player assembles a set of discovered artifacts. Uh, it could be fun doing artifacts. Actually, this is interesting. It could work into the Scrapture universe for Phil's game that he's working on, and we're eventually going to publish about making cults, about relics that are dug up from our current time by future societies once our people are gone and can't explain what these relics are. They're making meaning around them. So the artifacts thing could build into that, which would be fun. Player assembles the discovered relics, provides it to other players. Artifacts contain components that describe, characterize one species. Archaeological digs, extra artifacts that got mixed in and muddy the picture. Can the other players sort out the relevant artifacts and figure out what it means? Ooh. This is a little different than this dinosaur game, but I like... Uh the partial information communication style of the game. We've come, been coming up with a lot of games recently that have to do with information and player communication. And <laughs> I wonder if it's just the format of this stream that we're less likely to come up with abstract, very thinky games. So we've come up with a few of them, but our focus definitely seems to be on this interesting, interactive, communication of components. It may as me as just me as a designer designer where I'm pushing things into that direction, but it's cool. I really like it. Uh, flubbed <laughs> flubbed communication. Imperfect information. Imperfect narrator. Oh, Great Dinosaur Rush. Oh my gosh, it's going to be the thing that I was looking at that I am totally going to rip off now. 2016. Mm. Players compete to grab bones from the best dig sites and build a new dinosaurs for prestigious museums, gaining notoriety in the process by stealing bones, sabotaging dig sites, and otherwise impeding your fellow paleontologists. Wow, this is a thing, and it already it also... Bleh already has a very well regarded game based on it so that's pretty close <laughs> oh man that's pretty close actually to what we're talking about here okay so we have to tweak it a little bit or focus on the naming aspect i wonder if that's something they do Players create their dice from the bones, maximizing the score. Okay, so this is a little more strategic and technical. And potentially a little less of the bluffing element, but just to be on the safe side, might want to go more for uh, alien scientists 
vibe or the artifacts thing to push it a little bit further away from what we're doing. The naming is important, I feel like. It is an important part of where we're going with this idea. Also, thank you, Game Biologist, for the research there. As I always say to people who are newer to game design, there, there can never be too many games based on a particular theme or genre. For example, train games. There are so many train games, literally infinite amount of train games. And then it just became a whole genre of train games. And people make new train games all the time. Some lesser known niches, people can feel a little weird. It's like, oh, there aren't that many carnival themed games. Is it too much like this other one? But what could happen is you could just build out a whole new genre. People get really excited about making carnival games or candy games or cooking games, right? And then it just becomes a new thing and people, there's enough people in that niche to go around for all the people who want to design games in there. It is good to do a little bit of research and make sure that your game is doing something different just from a product perspective. Uh, if you put the game out there and people are playing, it's like, oh, this is just like this other game. Oh, this is very similar to th this other game. Th people aren't always correct when they make those statements, but it's good to at least be aware of what's out there so you can answer those questions. Be like, oh, it's actually not at all like that because of blah, blah, blah. So should I join the toaster cult or the blender cult? Hmm. Oh, man. <laughs> This, so yeah, we're talking about Scrapture here. Wanna, uh, where is Scrapture? Must be in game design. I'm gonna see if I have any of the cards here. It's really fun stuff. Ooh, pictures of the cards. get those pictures from Phil so I can just have all the cards here and show them because it's really fun stuff. The artifacts in particular are so good. Uh, blender or toaster? Th okay, you know, you're just saying this blender or toaster thing. I don't actually know if we have a blender or toaster yet in Scrapture and both of those are fantastic. And we're looking for more relics so there you go. Might end up with a toaster relic. So uh, some of the cooler ones are the football Helmet. Um, can't exactly see it uh, in this picture, but I can. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, copy Dropbox link. I can throw it up here so you, you can't see the full description of it, but you'll be able to see the kinds of things that are on the cards. You see the football helmet here, it's the second skull, and it has uh, an ability related to protecting your followers and a little bit of flavor text that goes along with it as well. So that's a really cool one. There's a Twinkie in there, not infringing. So it's a, uh, shh, go away, go away. It's an enduring confection. It doesn't actually reference Twinkie, but is a packaged snack item. Uh, and there's a Snuggie in there, bottle of detergent, map of monuments, which is a roll and move board game board. So a lot of fun stuff in there. Toaster though, I don't know if there's a toaster. That'd be a good one to put in there. Email that says, oh, but I mean, if for the actual question, toaster cult or the blender cult, probably the blender cult, because you don't want to be on the receiving end of that, I guess I would say. All right, Game Biologist about the Great Dinosaur Rush, I believe this has been referenced too, uses colored wooden bars that players try to collect and assemble into patterns onto cards. Ooh, it abstracts the concept of fat fossils a lot. So it's a matter of red parts go here, green parts go there for a pattern on a card. Mm. Clue closer. Ooh, interesting. Huh. Yeah, let me pull this over here so y'all can see what we're discussing. So when they're creating the fossil, it's more about getting the actual pieces. Huh. 
that's kind of cool. It's like a, a little bit of a ticket to ride idea, getting the right colored pieces to go in the right spots. It's not about look at this image and try to figure out what kind of limb anatomical structure it is and how it might fit into a new undiscovered animal. See, there's just, like I was saying, there's never enough fossil games. So for, to differentiate this concept that we we're talking about with bluffing the creation of the fossils, be they dinosaurs or whatever, uh, so different, differentiate by creating an interesting way for the fossil Fragment cards? Fragments cards. Uh, cards or tiles, maybe? To fit together. Yeah, I'll think about that. Tiles or like clear acrylic things with bones in them? That would be pretty cool. <laughs> acrylic components with bones uh, cast inside them. <laughs> Sounds expensive. I don't know. I'll go crazy here. It's just ideas, right? I think an important part of this game would be that your creature would look like a satisfying animal. I don't know exactly how that would work logistically, but if it had a long neck portion or like long limbs versus short ones. Again, with a, I had drawn my picture here of the cards and putting together a creature. With the just traditional cards being the same size, it would get a little weird, so play around with that, see interesting design challenge, see how those things would fit together. To really communicate. Satisfying feel of assembling, um, reassembling, reconstructing, I think is the word I'm looking for here. Reconstructing the fossil. You could also do Frankenstein's monster, learning to creature construction sort of thing, right? <laughs> Seems relevant today. Evil house robot cult. Uh oh. <laughs> Evil box robot cult. <laughs> That's funny. I have a box on my nightstand. It talks to me. Mostly when I talk to it, but also sometimes not when I talk to it. It's fine. I'm just sure to be really nice to the robot boxes because during the robot uprising, inevitable, my hope is that I've been nice enough and built up enough uh, trust and appreciation that they'll keep me around for entertainment, maybe? Hopefully, something like that, something to that effect. Hmm. Okay, so this one idea is pretty fleshed out. The tricky part and the thing that I would have to sit down and have some heads down time figuring out would be how are you making the things, both the scientific treaties or the blueprint of how things fit together.
how things go together scientifically. Scientifically proven. How you assemble the actual remains. Noodling on that a little bit is going to, I mean, I think that's where a lot of it comes down to. I think it could go in either direction. Like that's making that satisfying sounds a little bit complicated. You could go in the other direction and have it be more pure bluffing game. hone in on the bluffing and naming aspect of it. So you just have hands of cards, um, name cards, maybe, or I'm just spitballing here. I'm not sure exactly what that looked look like. So you're playing cards and you like play the third card and then you name the thing and then you get to claim the glory of it. And get to claim glory. Actually, this seems a little more like a separate game, like more like a uh, regular. <laughs> idea the third is going above idea the second because that's farther down on the page. Um, for this one, maybe there's. I just want to focus on the naming of things. This seems fun. I don't think there's enough games that are about naming things. Modifiers that lets you add a third, fourth, fifth card. Steal the glory of naming the thing from someone. Maybe again, coming back to animals, maybe there's pictures of alien species. You have to come up with the best name. People can argue it's a bad name. Like if it's a striped uh, burger thopter. Um, striped burger wing or something and it has nothing to do with burgers and doesn't have any stripes on it then it could be discounted by other people uh and maybe you can an argument game where you can argue for your name to stick sticky names Does the name stick? Make the name stick. I don't know, that seems light funny. It seems easier to put that together. And just, like, I like this direction. I think there's some interesting stuff going on here. But this is kind of cool. I have just really leaning into the naming of things and the fact that there aren't a lot of good naming games. I don't know if you can think of any good naming games that I'm missing, let me know, but I don't know if the, I can't really think off the top of my head about naming as a mechanic. <laughs> what would be weird is if sentient robots use the term fleshed out. <laughs> I don't like it. Fun story of drama, intrigue, and racing for glory in scientific naming circles. This seems relevant. Hmm. Travis Thomas is a rookie turtle researcher in Florida. He was on the verge of publishing his first big paper and naming two new species of turtle when he found out he'd been scooped by a stranger in Australia. Raymond Hoser, aka the Snake Man. Raymond is a reptile wrangler and amateur herpetologist who's managed to name hundreds of animals and has made a lot of enemies in the process. 
Hmm. That, hmm, like that. I mean, I don't like the fact that this person is stealing animal names from people, but I never knew there was such trauma in the creature naming world. just put this all up in this idea because this is leaning more into the naming concepts the drama tension stealing naming rights hmm. that could be a fun thing to lean into so I don't uh, game biologists, I, I put it to you, chat, to see if there's any other games that deal specifically with stealing the glory of scientific naming. That is a very specific, particular game theme. Potential game theme. gonna start getting ready to wrap things up for today it's been and how do <laughs> how do it's been pretty productive today I've come up with a few potential ideas this quite fascinating bluffing naming game more fun casual name slash glory kudos stealing game there's one more thing we're looking into. About the true names. Discovery species. Oh, I did the second. I was like, where did that idea go that we were talking about? Naming things, and then you have power over them. Um. So before we head out, I wanted to tweak this idea. So we have three ideas, yay! Never have too many ideas for game designs. Pew pew, pew pew. You learn their true name. You can communicate with them, establish a bond or relationship they know their true name they have picked or decided upon their true name it's up to you to figure out how to ask for it the right way Back to this scientific naming game. It's a legacy game. You have to race around the board collecting species, observations, and making documentation. And hope that nobody beats you to it. So you want to be a little stealthy with your plans. And the winner gets to write the name they pick into the game. I do like that too. There's, man, a lot of fun, rich stuff going on here. Link. So yeah, we're talking about boards, components, game evolves over time once things have been named. Man. Tidying up my notes a little bit. I love coming up with the ideas on this stream. One thing that I really realized from doing the live role playing game creation, PAX West, a couple of weeks ago, is 
game design is a very interesting balance between ideation, expansive thinking, where you just throw a lot of stuff out there, uh, taking in absorption or taking in information. So you start to look at things like we're talking about here. We have the rodents, we have the scientific naming, the, the drama and tension that comes from naming a lot of stuff that I didn't really know that much about before this. And now I'm taking in this information, which is great. The stream is great for that. And the other aspect of design is the ideas that are coming out over here and then information that's coming out over here and letting that stuff sit and gel and process and come together, which is, we're coming up with the, the seeds of a lot of great ideas on this stream. And I think it's like to really move them forward, I need to let them percolate and come into a form. But on the other side, on the other hand, maybe that's an incorrect impulse. Again, I've been working harder on getting more games or at least prototypes out faster so that I can prove whether the idea is even worth working on. Because uh, I'm starting to build up tons of ideas in the backlog of potential things to work on. And a lot of the ideas are just so cool and so exciting. And I think where it's easy to get caught up is in this idea of, oh, I gotta wait to get for the ideas to all come together until I'm really sure of the direction I want this game to move in. Or you just be like, yeah, this is great. This is fossil naming. My first instinct is to have the names on the cards. You're throwing things down on the cards. Ooh, here's a good adjunct to that. Um, Drawing down name fragments on cards. Maybe the cards also have modifiers or powers that you can use to edge yourself towards claiming the thing you're trying to name. Cool. Lots of cool stuff here. Next step is to get some of the more fleshed out ideas down onto paper so there can be more games in the world. Because that's our goal. To take some of these games and make them be things that people can play. Oh man, excuse me. Yeah. Name fragments on cards. Mm -hmm. I'm also th gonna put this idea the fourth. It's not really a 3.5. More along this line. Uh, so maybe less about naming. Mm, you could get to name the species you claim, or there could be a web app name generator for your species. I always like that, having a name generator and then being able to play or like just cycle it a bunch of times and also being able to put the pieces together. Cause it's gonna be a lot easier to come up with something based on some pre-generated items as opposed to coming up with things from scratch. Uh, more focused on the trickery, secrecy, bluffing, negotiation of getting to name it. Hmm. 
and we can dig a little bit more into the science of what it means to name something. Do you have to have pictures of it, documentation? Uh, again, this person's writing a paper. Do you have to have information? Are people stealing that? Are people sharing the information publicly and someone is stealing that? <laughs> what are the requirements to name something? And again, potentially if you're doing a space or science uh, alien theme to this, you can tweak those requirements so it's not necessarily a game that truly reflects how things happen in the real world, but have a little bit more control over how it works mechanically. Uh, things in your hand include partial pictures, fossils, bones, uh, research, paper, notes, um, observation, diary notes. You could put, put in notes of this as like, oh, length. Length, habitat, etc. So it's a mix of these items you need and then other cards or items that can improve your chances of winning the naming competition. <laughs> so you're about last minute game of day, umbrellas versus ponchos. <laughs> Are you helping? Is this helping right now? I, fine. <laughs> Idea the fifth. Umbrellas versus ponchos. You see, the question is, is this like a battle game where the umbrellas and the ponchos are duking it out? Or this is a more uh, a set uh, argument game, like a super fight style game where people are arguing whether umbrellas or ponchos are better. Argument game, which is best. Uh, combat game, they fight each other. <laughs> Derailing, oh my gosh, you so are. Okay, cool. On that note, I think that's enough game design ideation for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate everyone taking the time to chat and contribute and listen and watch and however you like to engage with the stream. If you like what you see here, you can follow the channel, you can subscribe, feel free in the chat to post things you want to discuss about. You can also reach out to me on Twitter at Emma Larkins before or after the show to discuss the kinds of things that we do here. I always love to hear, hear your thoughts. If you want to see more of the physical construction of a game, more of the ideating, talk about different aspects of design. I love it all. Love thinking and talking about it all. Uh, so yeah, here every Tuesday, except for the Tuesdays when I'm not, and I also do a casual gaming stream on Friday where you can catch me playing games with my husband and just having a more casual, fun streaming environment. I also do streaming for Gen Con on the channel Gen Con TV. I do a weekly fireside with Peter Atkinson talking about the history of magic and a board game news show on Fridays where we talk about board game news, lots of board game stuff been lovely having you today. Thanks so much for being here and I will see you around the table. Bye. As I copy this relevant tweet to my notes, check that out.